Joining Steve now is Larry Culp, Chairman and CEO of General Electric. Welcome, Larry. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Culp. Hey, folks, there's a lot of seats up here in the front. They just depress me. So kind of like just don't, you know, folks in the back, come on up. Just come on up. You'll be on C-SPAN. We've got C-SPAN covering this whole thing. Come on up, Phil. Ignore the VIP. You are VIPs, so come on up. You know, just fill this all up. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. You're all my guests. Say you're friends of Steve. Come on in. Great. Uh, so, Larry, it's great to see you. Um, I'd like our uh, audience to get a sense of what it was like navigating one of the world's great brands and companies during the pandemic, during a supply chain crisis. Like, how did you keep planes flying? Because you're in an insane number of planes. I think you're in three quarters of the planes of the world, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so part of today in having as many CEOs we have is to understand how you prioritize things in a crisis. Well, Steve, thanks for the invitation. Always good to be with you. you know, I think that we were already in a crisis in many respects prior to the pandemic, right? There was a lot happening at GE well before March of, of 2020. We had in excess of $100 billion of debt we needed to wind down, and we really needed to get back to our operating routes. So there was a lot. Have you wound it down? We're on the other side of that $100 okay. billion yeah, dollar good. leveraging. Wow. So uh, we, we rest easy in that regard. You can play a lot of offense. Uh, as some people may know, we are halfway through a two-step process by which we've now spun out GE Healthcare as an independent company. We're a year away from doing the same thing with our power and renewables businesses under the GE Vernova brand. And then GE Aerospace will be the go forward GE. But during the pandemic, Steve, I think we just kept doing what we were doing. And that was making sure that we were focused on our customers, helping them where we could, right? We were on the front lines in Wuhan mm -hmm. with our GE healthcare business. A, C a GE CT scanner was really the, uh, the first diagnostic tool in use. Our service teams were, were on the ground. We didn't have to keep too many planes flying, unfortunately, because we saw so much of air travel grind to a halt. But power demand didn't change whatsoever. So everything that we do, both in terms of conventional power and renewables, hmm. kept, kept moving forward. And despite the forecast that the world was about to end, I think we knew we just needed to get up the next day and keep moving forward, trying to serve our customers, all the while working through the more strategic elements of the GE transformation. So, you know, one of the interesting things I'm thinking, and you know, your company represents it, is you're, is you're like looking, you know, if you're moving into a net zero world when it comes to carbon emissions, mm -hmm. climate targets, and, you know, you build big stuff and engines, which I assume burn a lot of carbon, but, you know, as you kind of look at rebalancing that decarbonization and these goals, all these different pieces, how is industry doing? How is GE doing with that? How do you balance between gas guzzling engines and less gas guzzling engines? Well, jet fuel is what powers all of those flights that you referenced, right? And, and when we're fortunate, given the business that we built up at GE Aerospace over decades to just last year having flown 3 billion people where our engines were underway. What's important, I think, to recognize, Steve, is it's an industry just given the cost structure of an airline and how critical bringing fuel costs down are, that we've always been in the efficiency business. And what we might have called in the past efficiency, we might now talk about as sustainability. Right? If you look at the engines today that many of you probably flown, uh, flew with yesterday, they're anywhere between 30 and 40% more efficient than their predecessors, just going back to the last generation, the 70s and the 80s. Our current technology, what we call our LEAP engine, which powers the, the primary narrow body airplanes out there, is the next step in that regard. Mm. So as much as the pandemic and the recovery from the pandemic has pushed us hard to help our airlines put those, our, our airline customers put those planes back up in the air, all the while working with the Boeings and the Airbuses of the world to deliver more planes with our engines on them, we've continued to invest in new technology because we know that as we think about a net zero world, 
right? Our open rotor rise technology going to be critical, mm. pushing forward with hydrogen, hybrid electric, also core areas of investment force are going to be key. And perhaps most importantly over the next decade is sustainable aviation fuel, right? We have flown with SAF today, right? We had a, we had a flight last year with, Amer uh, with United Airlines where we had a, a fully SAF powered uh, single engine, a two engine plane. So those are the sorts of things that we're doing. The IRA is a big help in that regard because of the, uh, the, the, the blender's incentive. So you like it. I was going to ask you if the Inflation Reduction Act was friend or foe. Very much a friend. And I, I'd say it was, it was a friend in terms of the aerospace business, because while we need more help, I think, to bring the price of SAF down, it was really a game changer at GE Vernova, our, again, our power and renewables business. We generate probably, or our equipment's used to generate a third of the world's electricity. Hmm. And we have a of full, the whole world. Of the whole world. And it's a, it's a full portfolio, gas, wind, nuclear, and we've got an important grid overlay right, to, to deliver that energy. When you think about that, there's a lot there that's happening in terms of yeah. technology. Uh, I have to ask you a fun question. You know, years ago, I interviewed one of your, you know, a couple slots ago uh, predecessors, uh, Jeff Immel. And at that time, I, you know, talked about Jack Welch and the famous GE Cultural. And yeah. he said, Steve, let me tell you, when Jack Welch was CEO, he takes a lot of credit for stuff. But he says, my German shepherd could have run GE and still done well. And, and I, it was an on-the-record statement, so I quoted him and with this. I'm just interested in how, you know, you look at that hubris, if you will, or that yeah. kind of confidence about the time and the decisions you've had to make and breaking up GE and different things. Yeah. You know, is there, there a lament that, it's, that, that, that the world didn't stay static and you weren't able to kind of continue to be this, be a myth? When has the world ever stayed static, mm. right? Life would be boring if that were the case. I think what we're excited about at GE is that we have three phenomenal, important businesses, GE Healthcare, GE Aerospace, and GE Vernova, mm. right? If we really are going to change care around the world, if we aren't really going to see net zero in flight, let alone complete the energy transition, GE has to play a major role. GE is going to lead. Going forward, I think very much in the spirit of Edison, those are going to be three independent companies. Mm. They'll be focused not on corporate, not on the center, not on ourselves, but on customers, needs, technology investments, everything that frankly I think Edison would hopefully recognize and applaud today. So we're excited about the future. It's easy to look back. I haven't done that in four and a half years, right? My focus has been on where we go in the future. And things like the IRA really do help us catalyze more demand with respect to onshore and offshore wind, important areas of innovation for us. We're going to see 150 to probably 200 gigawatts of onshore wind deployed just here in the U.S. over the next decade on the back of the IRA. Now, we need to obviously see the rules come out from Treasury. We need to see permitting reform in uh, in a serious way, but those are opportunities we're reform excited is a, about, Steve. You see permitting reform as a big deal. It's a very big deal. It's a very big deal. You know, if, right? you, if you were to have, you know, President Biden, I don't know, Joe Manchin, um, trying to think of who's on the left of Joe Manchin, I don't know, Bernie, I mean, it's, you know, you have people in there in the kind of the broad energy picture today. What do you think they're getting wrong on the energy picture? I mean, you're in wind, gas, nuclear, yep. all of these things, but what are they, you know, when I look at it and look at how rich and abundant the resources are, but I also understand climate matters. What are they not, what's the balance and equilibrium point they're not getting right that a CEO like you sees and you're irritated by them? I'm not easily irritated, Steve, but I, I think that today here in the U.S., we're getting a lot right. So I, I would come at it more from an optimistic view be it the events in Ukraine, be it the Inflation Reduction Act, I think what we see is no less ambition, but frankly, a greater level of pragmatism with respect to the energy transition. We have to solve for the trilemma, right? We've got to solve for energy security or reliability. We have to solve for affordability, and we have to do so in a sustainable way. You can't pick one of those three dimensions and think you're going to solve the problem. And I think today what you see here in the U.S., what we see abroad is a more pragmatic approach where all of those technologies are going to be embraced, all of those technologies are going to be pushed. 
so that we really have a shot at, uh, at net zero. It won't be easy, it won't be a straight line, but I think we're encouraged by what we see. Again, we really want to see final guidance out of the IRS. I think permitting, serious permitting reform is important, right? It's, it's baseball season now. Baseball's innovated with a pitch clock. No reason not to have that same mindset with respect to permitting reform. Otherwise, these incentives and the projects that they could support will languish. When you're navigating the supply chain crisis, I don't know how you kept building the things you did because you know I couldn't get a dishwasher. Um, not sure you know how how you were doing it, but I understand that part of the framing approach you do is lean, the lean play. Yes. Tell us about lean. Explain to our audience. We have a lot of folks that are lay people to this. Tell us what that playbook looks like and how have you deployed it. Steve, when we talk about lean, we are really using industry shorthand for what originated at Toyota after World War II in the Toyota production system. Very simply, it's all about the customer, continuous improvement, and respect for people. Mm. Now, that's common sense, right, in any business. The way I would describe it, it's common sense vigorously applied. And that was something that we were doing, again, pre-pandemic at mm. GE to really change the way we run our businesses and ultimately transform the culture. What it's really helped us do in these supply chain challenges is to make sure that we're working with the folks in our facilities to root out as much waste mm. and inefficiency as we can in whatever form that may exist to improve our throughput at a time when our suppliers are often a pinch point and people point fingers at suppliers, we're going in and working very closely with them, deploying the same principles, deploying the same tools so that they can do more with less. And in turn, we can take those components, be it a jet engine for Boeing or let's say a gas turbine for, for, for Duke Energy and keep, uh, keep moving forward. It's a daily battle. I wouldn't say it's gotten materially better over the last 12 months, but I'm so thankful that the GE team embraced this operating model well before the pandemic, because as we've come out of it, particularly in aerospace with this dramatic recovery, just this morning, uh, fun fact, commercial departures are at, an, at 94% of 2019 levels this week, a year, four, three, four years ago, right? So the, the, the aerospace recovery is nothing short of remarkable, but it's challenging for all of us as manufacturers and service providers. Lean's helping us navigate that in the best possible way, but again, a daily grind. Look, you're also in the national security space and you make uh, jet engines, as I understand you're involved in fighters and, and, and yes. stuff like this. And I know that there have been some decisions made right now where, as I understand it, there is an inability to look at the kind of long-term funding needs. So people are looking, okay, what short-term funding is causing some hard choices mm -hmm. um, that, that I think are consequential for GE, but it reminds me of something I learned from some of your team about the wind industry, that the economics of the wind industry is based on permits and all this other stuff. Right. Do budgeters in the national security space, given the geopolitical tensions in the world today, China, Russia, things happening, are we getting the equivalent of permits and credits in the wind industry wrong when it comes to jet fighter engines? Well, I, I wouldn't say that we're getting it wrong, but I think we need to take little, or we should take little for granted, right? The Congress has put over $4 billion in an advanced engine program called AETP. It has, for us, allowed us to develop what is called the XA100, which is a next generation engine for the F-35. This engine, when deployed, will provide 30% more range, 20% greater acceleration and more thermal management. Just think about all of the computers in, a, in an aircraft today. Thermal management means heat. The computers throw yeah. off a lot of heat. That heat needs to be managed, okay. and the engine plays a role in that. So it gets hot up there. It gets very hot. And if you're a pilot, that's not a comfortable situation. So tremendous capability. There are two engines in the world that can do this. We happen to have both of them. And I think the com conversation with the Congress right now is where do we go from here on the back of the progress we've made with the, that $4 billion of investment? Not all of, all of it came to GE, mind you, but when we think about preparedness going forward, think about the role the F-35 plays, we're of the view that the XA-100 is important technology to have on board into the future. 
So just on this geopolitical front, how does the world look to you? I mean, as you look at what's you know, happening with Russia, I mean, you, you, you know, GE was one of the big you know, places that kept lights on on Russia. Right. You're in China, I mean, you're all over the world. I mean, you're you know, in Europe. Do, does the world pulling itself a little apart, and maybe I'm overstating it right now, give you concern about what the world and markets look like 10 years from now? Well, certainly, that, that balkanization, right, has, has made operating a company like GE, and I'm sure many others, more challenging than it has been in the past. But that said, I think that the success GE has enjoyed all around the world has increasingly been a function of our ability to be more local while leveraging our global capabilities. Hmm. And as we go forward, Steve, I think that simply becomes even more fundamental to our success. Right? Again, you think about what we do today, be it in healthcare, and despite the fact GE Healthcare is an independent company, what we do in aerospace, what we do in energy, we address the world's most important challenges. Mm. Those are challenges that are relevant everywhere on the globe. So the more local we are while continuing to invest in court technologies, I think we'll set GE up for success over the next decade, but we're gonna have to earn that. So ladies and gentlemen, Larry Culp, who is chairman and CEO of GE, he's got like all these little companies got different types. So what are you now, your chairman and CEO of GE, your CEO of GE, and what are you in Vernova? I, that's one of the businesses that reports to me. A okay. Wonderful leader Scott Strait. So that's still in that your is still in your area. I'm doing double duty. I'm also also the CEO. Do you get GE stock Aero in all space. the companies. Do you get a little bit of stock in all of these? These are great stocks to own. I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, Larry Culp, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you.